Good morning, friends, and welcome to this service of worship at St. Paul United Methodist Church, downtown Ocean Springs. Thank you for joining us. We pray that you will be blessed as we worship together. Let us begin by singing our first hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Affirmation of faith is the Apostles' Creed. Let us unite together in this historic confession. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. We rejoice and give thanks on this Lord's Day and Pentecost Sunday that the Holy Spirit prays with us and intercedes with sighs deeper than words, as the Apostle Paul said. And we, as, as people gathered, God's people gathered, whether online or in person, uh, know that God is in our midst and we give great thanks for that. And so as we prepare to pray together as God's people, we'd simply remind you that we have a prayer ministry here at St. Paul. Feel free to utilize that as you have a prayer concern or need that you will want to be sure you have a group praying for. Uh, feel free to contact pastors as well and, and staff and share your prayer concerns and joys. Let us pray together. Holy God, like a rushing wind, your spirit moved upon the first disciples on the day of Pentecost and like a purifying fire, your spirit seared their hearts and minds with the message of salvation. Send your spirit upon your church in this time and place, we pray. For the church throughout the world, Almighty God, hear our prayers, all our prayers, we pray. Inspire the sons and daughters of your church for prophetic witness to your truth. And upon old and young, give clarity of vision to acknowledge your saving power in the world. Stir up our courage, rouse us to prophetic witness that we may join with them to proclaim to the world your mighty deeds of power in Jesus Christ. As people of, of this world, we pray for the nations of the world and its leaders. We pray for economic welfare and justice for all. We pray that you would overcome the babble of misunderstanding among the nations and even within our own. And let all people hear in their own language, recognize in their own culture, your unifying message of love. Renew, uh, renew your earth, and we pray. Make us good stewards of its resources. Teach us to enjoy its abundance rightly. We lift up also our prayers for those who are sick or, or who are experiencing distress in mind, body, or spirit, praying that you may restore them to health and to the joy of your salvation. We lift up all these prayers in the name of Christ our Lord and give thanks for your spirit, O oh God, the source of life. Refresh us in your spirit. Reshape our desires, recreate our hearts, that we may show forth your love and your enduring glory. Through Jesus Christ we pray, as we also together pray the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. <clears throat> and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is a good and right and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to offer ourselves and our gifts to God as a part of our worship. Uh, we offer our gifts now, and in this moment of offering, a simple reminder that there are uh, numerous ways in order to give to God's glory through this local church, St. Paul United Methodist Church. Giving online is easy. You'll see the giving link, give.stpaulos.org, or go to our church website and find the Give button. Uh, through the mail, it is St. Paul UMC, P.O. Box 909, Ocean Springs. Thank you for your continued, uh, your continued generosity and faithfulness. To God be the glory. Let us now offer our, our prayer together. It is call and response, leader and then congregation. Let us pray. 
The Holy Spirit was sent to increase our compassion and to make us glad to spread good news by caring for those in need. May you enter into the discipline of giving as a work of the Holy Spirit within you. God of mercy, we give you thanks for all that your bounty creates. The gifts we bring today acknowledge our debt to you and our intent to relieve others of their burdens. Bless what we offer and bless those who will be shown deeds of power through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Uh -huh.
Our scripture reading for this Pentecost Sunday is the traditional one from the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they, where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Now how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Serena, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I was in southern Spain called also Andalusia, a beautiful place on God's earth, when it happened. Brad, our spiritual and travel guide, had warned us that not only that it might happen, but that it probably would. I was at the store where several of us pastors who were on this trip together had found an appropriate gifts to take back home to our beloved family. But there was a credit card glitch when, it got up to, when I got to my time at the counter and I was supposed to be cleared for purchases in Europe, but it wasn't giving me any credit. The representative on the phone, you know, was not very helpful and put me on hold. And I could not even communicate satisfactorily with the clerk at the checkout. I didn't know many words of Spanish, still don't. And, and I, I couldn't get resolution. And our guide, Brad, who spoke for us in these times again, was not there. So I just went and put those items for purchase back on the shelf. I went around the corner then to buy some postcards to take my mind off that experience. But when the vendor told me how many euros I owed for the cards, the selected cards, I really questioned. I wondered, you know, if I was being taken for a ride. Uh, it didn't seem like the right amount. And so it was either purchase or not. There was no clarifying conversation to be had. I, I didn't speak the language, so I just forgot about it. And I went on my way a little discouraged and distraught until I happened to walk by a couple of my clergywomen colleagues who were at the cafe having coffee. Then all of a sudden, I was communicating with people for, with whom I knew the language. And I could tell them all about my frustrations and experience. It helps to know the language. Face it, even when we know the language, communication can be hard, right? And challenging. Even when we speak uh, the same lexicon, experts like uh, Dr. Gary Chapman talk about the love languages. He talks about 
you know, the emotional language of emotion and how we experience love. His book uh, kind of became a milestone in that it, 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 the, the different five love languages have kind of become a part of our culture now. When you ask somebody, what's your love language? A lot of times they would have read about it in another article that a primary love language is, is one through which we personally experience care and love. And there's, according to his thesis, Dr. Chapman's thesis, each of us have a primary one, although we may resonate with all of them. They are words of affirmation, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, and physical touch. He mentions, especially since his book is mostly about marriage, seldom do husband and wife have the same primary emotional language, but even if they do, it's possible that they will speak different dialects of that language and still have work to do with trying to communicate and support and love one another. You know, we all have those variations of, uh, I think it was Abbott and Costello, and that old gag about who's on first. Uh, you know, we say the words and, and mean something else. It happens every day. I remember when I was uh, a senior in seminary, for one semester, I had a student chaplaincy. It was called Clinical Pastoral Education at Emory Hospital in Atlanta. And there was a wonderful floor nurse who I often uh, visited and talked with about the patients I was going on her floor to go and check on. And sometimes uh, I would be able to look at the charts and what have you before I, before I went to visit the, with the patients. Well, Gwen was telling me this particular day, early on, when I was just beginning, about several uh, rooms of patients who were in uh, distress and going through things. And she said, it's a real train wreck. <laughs> I didn't know whether to take her literally or not to go look at the charts and say, were all these people involved in a train wreck? But if she was using the expression, well, she and the other nursing staff had a good laugh on me, this young man, uh, neophyte chaplain. But that whole experience was really something. Uh, it's part of the a method of the madness, uh, this clinical pastoral education, a neophyte chaplain thrown into really a kind of chaos because there's really no way to prepare for an encounter with people who are in the deep throes of grief. Grief, you know, itself is kind of like a tornado. There's really no manual, no procedure. And so leadership in the face of grief is a lot of pure intuition, yeah, to be honest with you. All you can do is face it and then manage yourself the best way you can, then respond to these situations as they arise. Uh, I found it helpful over time to expect the unexpected. And a common mistake that I made a number, of, a number of my peers as well, the mistake of thinking that we could control many aspects of the situations we were thrown in. And so you might find yourself in the small room called the death room where a grieving family had gathered. About a dozen family members were in this not real big room. One woman is banging her head against the wall, you know, in a kind of rhythm. Another one is wailing loudly. Another one is, well, leaning over a trash can, heaving and vomiting. Another person is just wildly punching the air, you know, trying to punch the grief away. Some are groaning, some are screaming, some hyperventilating. And the experienced chaplains uh, would later tell us, we call this wailing and flailing, but that really didn't help a lot in that moment. The family's matriarch had suddenly passed away on the surgery table from complications, and the nurses had brought in this family into the death room to give them the news. Now, that sounds like chaos. It is. That's an accurate description. But there is also a method to the madness uh, for us neophyte students. You put a person like that into a trauma environment for a, 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 an amount of time, in my case, a school semester, it helps that person process how he or she shows up to develop, you know, a kind of self-awareness and maybe become a pastoral presence in the face of this massive grief and anxiety. You may even get to the place where you're able to enter uh, that kind of a room and focus on what the family actually needs as opposed to the nurses trying to say, please try to get them out so we can, you know, have the room available or somebody else telling you something else. Whether or not it is a real train wreck, it's possible to listen 
and then to speak the language needed for the moment. It was just a little room in Jerusalem where this event happened that Luke tells us about on what we now call the day of Pentecost. He recounts what seemed to some, you know, like an explosion of chaos. It was an event indeed that sent out ripples throughout the whole world, known world, but it originated in just this little space in Jerusalem. But it exploded with the force of a fire and mighty wind, and suddenly these disciples were spirit-filled, and Luke tells us, speaking in languages they had never learned. Boy, if that's not significant, the Spirit of God is multilingual, he tells us. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, enabling every, each of them and all of them to communicate God's word in these different languages. So the Holy Spirit isn't restricted to one elite language or one superior culture, as almost everyone had assumed. Instead, the Spirit speaks to everyone, everywhere, in his or her native tongue. It was a miracle of speaking in foreign languages, so that they're they were communicating the gospel to people, including non-believers, in their own languages. Wow. What looked like chaos to outsiders and to some of those outsiders who, you know, didn't really, were not really prepared for it, <laughs> it may have looked like a scene of where, where the wild things are. Because they said, oh, they are filled with new wine. Uh, drunk, in other words. But Peter said no in his speech. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, meaning maybe that if it had been later in the day, drunk may have been a real possibility. But no, no. To others who heard it, it was gospel. It was life-giving news. It was proclaiming new life. As Paul said, faith comes through hearing. And it was the word of life and new life. Then Peter got up and delivered this sensational sermon based on the second chapter of Joel. In the last days, he, he proclaimed. He's quoting Joel, the prophet Joel in the Old Testament, who was quoting God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And this is what is happening now, Peter tells them. The Holy Spirit of God is being poured out on them, and this is what it looks like. Wind like the wind that revived a valley of dry bones, the prophet Ezekiel uh, talked about. And fire like the fire that, that had led the people of Israel through the desert, that pillar of fire. And tongues like the tongues that erupted in the Tower of Babel. But this time, it's the reverse. At Babel, because of people's hubris and pride, God confused the speech so that people could not understand each other anymore. But at Pentecost, God reverses the curse. And what sounds like Babel is speech they can understand. Better yet, it is gospel. And they understand it and they know it is good news for them. So when Luke talks about the native languages, you know, he lists all those Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, etc., etc. He is describing people from all over the known world. And what happened in that room spread from Jerusalem to Athens to Rome to Alexandria. It spread across nations, across centuries, across cultures, as far removed from Israel as we are from the moon. There was uh, an ad that some of you old timers like me may remember because at the time it was considered the world's most famous ad. I don't know about now, I'm talking about a television commercial, specifically Coca Cola in 1971, featuring singers on top of a mountaintop in Italy singing, I'd like to buy the world a Coke, I'd like to teach the world to sing, and I'd like to buy the world a Coke. Well, in that commercial, the camera pans uh, across all these faces and shapes and colors of people and different ethnicities as they sing from this hilltop in Italy, singing this. And it was produced at the time. It was the most expensive commercial ever. It was $250,000, which <laughs> may not sound like that much these days. But it was all the more outstanding because of how it touched a nerve in people. 
Uh, some people think it was because of the flower power era in which it came out when many Americans were tiring of the Vietnam War and the lyrics somehow, you know, had this hopeful message of peace and camaraderie. But for people of faith, they could look at that commercial, I think, and say, let us open our hearts. Let us dare believe the spirit can, we read about in the scriptures can move us today. Uh, Coca-Cola itself notwithstanding as the real thing. There's a different real thing, and the Spirit can move us that way. And then there's the biblical imagery itself. Those people, in this case, they were all attractive young people. That's where the diversity uh, kind of was limited because God's people gathered on the mountain as the prophet Isaiah, you know, of all ages and uh, all, all kinds of diversity. Remember, Isaiah said, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God. Remember the, the vision of Revelation at the end, a great multitude, more than anyone could count from every nation, every tribe, peoples, and languages, singing salvation belongs to God, our God who is seated on the throne. Those are images of the mountaintop to which we look. And they could look at that commercial and say, Let's dare to believe that the Spirit will empower, empower us in our times and make us agents of God's movement of justice and peace and joy. There is something else, and we're singing together on the mountain. Now, I won't, no wonder they call today the birthday of the Christian church, because the day of Pentecost, if you will remember, happened just seven weeks after those who had opposed Jesus had ended all this nonsense this Jesus nonsense with the crucifixion. But now, for some, their worst nightmare was coming true. This new, broad understanding of God's love would grow as it did that day. Luke tells us that 3,000 persons were baptized. God's deeds of power proclaimed in the languages of all the families of the earth. Still, there were those who sneered, sneered at the apostles. They're filled with new wine. Well, you know what? They were right. They were. They, they were the living fulfillment of that long promise of God. God's word was being heard. God's word was being shared. And God's communion was brought, is brought to us, to earth, to humanity here and now. So these tongues were not unintelligible glossolalia like we hear about Paul talking about it was a clear message in heaven and this burst out of singing for all the world to hear in Christ there is no east or west and because of what happened in that room people who did not speak or read a word of Hebrew have come to believe in a Hebrew Lord who is now worshipped in every language on earth mm. Mm -mm. What language do you need to hear today? Because I want to tell you, neither God nor the Bible cuts any corners when it comes to the language that we need. Uh, he really came to us as we are, Jesus himself, through Jesus himself, and likewise, he seeks to speak to us through the language that we need in order to hear that word. If you read through the Bible, you'll find a language of contrition, uh, of, of petitioning, of asking God for things that we need and others need. You'll hear the language of lament and of sorrow. You'll hear, even in the Psalms, complaint. Lord, when are you going to help us? It seems like it's been too long. And the language of gratitude, the language of rest and rejoicing as in Psalm 23. For some of us, it is the language of forgiveness that we need so terribly. We all do from time to time. We remember that Jesus first appeared to the disciples that night, that Easter night, appeared to them where they were huddled and said, peace be with you. And then he later said in a moment, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What all this says is we can never say of God what we have here is a failure to communicate. God is on the move, always seeking to speak our language. But we also learn this from Pentecost. 
if we don't know it enough from personal experience, life surprises us. As the great writer Hemingway said, the world breaks everyone and afterwards many of us are strong at the broken places. You know, the thing about Hemingway was he wrote those words earlier in his career in that, that great work, A Farewell to Arms. But later he had a work some years before he died about an old man in the sea, an old man who went out and he was, his whole ambition was to capture this great marlin, this fish out in the ocean. But it was not an easy task. The marlin eluded him and, and just took him his boat way farther and further out to sea, further than he really needed to go. He finally captured the marlin, secured him to the boat. But then he had that long voyage back to shore to take the marlin. Even if you haven't read the book, you're probably familiar with the story and what happened. The sharks arrived. The sharks started eating the marlin as he made. And by the time he had reached the shore, all he had left when he looked for his fish was a bare skeleton. That, that, some believe, is a parable of Hemingway himself, this man of, of immense talent who finally uh, ended in despair. But there's another story to be told. We need to know all those stories of life. And it is this, that it is in the unpredictable, in the place of risk, and, and really in those areas where we have no control, where God is, is seeking to show up. And if we'll just give God half a chance, God will be speaking to us in the very thick of them. That's true to my experience, and I know it is to yours. Again, a common mistake we make, whether we're in the death room or wherever, is that we're in control of every aspect of the situation. Mm -mm. But out of that surprise, God speaks. Out of that surprise, God directs, and God gives life. Because he is the real thing, and he is what you and I and the whole world needs today. Thanks be to God for the hearing of his holy word. I simply say to you, if you need to hear a word today, give God the space and give God the chance. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our final hymn on this Pentecost Sunday is Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. Let us sing together.
forward this week in the strength of God's power. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit abide with you always. Amen. Amen.